Um, and now my pleasure to introduce Joseph Lutzi, who received his PhD from Yale, and he's the Asher B. Elderman Professor of Literature at Bard College. He's an award-winning teacher, scholar, and author. Joseph is the author of numerous books, most recently, Botticelli's Secret, um, uh, The Lost Drawings, and The Rediscovery of the Renaissance, which was a New York Best Books of 2022 selection. This is another star writer we got in our midst here. Um, so I'm going to pass the word to Joe for the uh, lecture. At the end, we'll have the usual question and answer. And right at the end, if you want to buy a book, I imagine Joe will, Joseph will Very sign happily. it for you. All right, over to you, Joseph. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really honored. And, you know, it's actually very moving because uh, I came to Florence first. My family's from Southern Italy. They immigrated to the United States in the late 1950s. And so I was born in the U.S. afterward. Um, and we, you know, my, we were a working class immigrant family. So travel was out of the question when I was a kid. But Italy always loomed large. In my in my uh, in my home, you know, my parents spoke in the Calabrian dialect, and I dreamed of kind of going to Italy one day. And I first went to Florence as an undergraduate, and in a way, it never left me because I keep coming back, I keep writing about it, and uh, to be in this space here, which really embodies that way in which Florence becomes a home for so many people all across the world, is so. Uh, I think fitting to be talking about this book. So I couldn't be happier to be here. And in a way it's also fitting because my book was born in Florence. Uh, obviously it's about a Florentine subject, but in a much deeper sense, it was about being in Florence and experiencing the art with fresh eyes and new eyes, even though these were works I had seen many times and I had made a career out of studying and writing about Italian culture. But this book was a great gift that came to me out of the blue. And I want to tell you really, you know, if this is a, a, a usual reading of a book, I would read some passages and take some questions and answer. But I think this book is actually a little different because A, it's about beautiful images. And so it's going to be very much driven by the paintings that inspired the book. And B, I want to really tell you more a story than do a reading. So I'm, I'm not gonna read too much from the book, just very briefly towards the end. And I'd like to start the story uh, in the way of all good books with an epigraph. Uh, and this epigraph is from quite a character. I don't know if any of you recognize this gentleman here um, to, to my right as I point. This is Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And uh, he was a pre-Raphaelite, fascinating figure, a uh, brilliant, uh, eccentric and unpredictable, a translator of Dante, a great painter himself. And he was also a, an unusual scholar. He was one of the people that put Sandro Botticelli, a name now that resonates for so many of us. He helped put Botticelli back on the map in the 19th century at a time when he was actually quite forgotten and off radar. And that's one of the things I wanna discuss with you this evening is how even the great Botticelli had disappeared for all intents and purposes for centuries. And so one day, in, it was in the academia, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti wrote a poem called uh, For Spring by Sandro Botticelli, okay? And spring, of course, is Primavera, the great Primavera, one of the most iconic artworks in the world. And in his poem, he wrote, what mystery here is read of homage or of hope? but how command dead springs to answer. And this, this quote became kind of a, a mantra to me as I wrote my book, because I think this is what we do when we look at paintings from the past. We're looking for messages. What message of homage or of hope, what mystery of homage or of hope is here to be read? How command dead springs to answer? How do you get the painting, dead springs, the primavera, an inanimate object? How do you get it to speak to you? And that's what I found myself in the position of, looking at paintings from the past and trying to get them to have a sort of conversation, to, to get them to speak, to find their messages of homage or of hope. And I think this is so important with someone like Botticelli. I mean, look at this painting here. Is there a more iconic painting in the world than 
Botticelli, La Nascita di Venere, The Birth of Venus. It's everywhere. I mean, when I was writing the book, by, I would get emails from friends saying, hey, I just saw it on olive oil. Hey, I just saw it on a new pasta sauce. And I'm like, I can do better than that. I saw it on Lady Gaga's ribcage. You know, when, you're, when you are wearing, when, when a pop star is wearing your painting on, you know, on her dress, you know you've made it. I always joke with my students, you know you've made it when this happens or when you can go by one name like Leonardo or Cher, you know, you, you've made it. Uh, so uh, this painting, which is so iconic, um, is in the Uffizi for all to see. Apparently Stendhal syndrome makes people faint in front of it. You, some of you have heard about that. Uh, that's been studied. And yet, we think we know so much about this painting, okay? Uh, what would this painting sell for? I sometimes think about that. You know, Leonardo Salvatore Mundi, which is a, a painting that has a lot of controversy around it, sold for $450 million. I think this would be the world's first billion dollar painting if it's sold. It's that iconic. It's that well-known. It's that revered and loved. But did you know that this painting was not shown to the public for the first 300 years of its life? It hung in a Medici villa until 1815. Basically, a few dozen people saw it. It wasn't shown. It wasn't open for public viewing. Now, think of what a loss to the world that is. And this really stuck with me because my book was about 100, almost 100 drawings of Dante by Botticelli that the world didn't see for hundreds of years, that disappeared. And how are we impoverished as a people, as a culture, when we don't have access to works like this? This stuck with me very much. And I thought about this a lot uh, a few years ago when I had the great honor and privilege of being on fellow. I was a fellow at Villa Itati, just, just not far from here. Some of you may have been there, beautiful, uh, Harvard University's uh, Center for Renaissance Studies. It was given to um, Harvard by Bernard Berenson, who was a great connoisseur, who brought, helped bring Botticelli to the United States and helped build the collections of American museums. Botticelli wasn't collected in the US until the 1900s. It was very, very unusual. People didn't want to take a chance on him. But Berenson became very wealthy in the process and was able to give this villa to his alma mater. Now, the interesting thing about, I was at Villa Itati, I, I'm writing, I wrote a book, I was writing a book there on uh, a kind of biography of the divine comedy over the centuries that will be published next year by Princeton University Press. But as I was writing this book, um, one day I, I got to see a facsimile of Botticelli's drawings. And that was part of my study of the divine comedy's reception. And I felt like I was seeing these drawings for the first time. Botticelli was commissioned around 1481 to illustrate all 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. And it became the project that almost ate him alive. He didn't finish it. Uh, it, was, it was, he was forced to finish it around 1495 by his patron. Um, the, most of them are in sketch form and we'll talk about that. And it was sort of done in the margins of his career as he was working on other more famous works like uh, like the Primavera okay, that you see here. So as I saw this volume and I started to thinking about these drawings, I also started to scour the city of Florence. This was in 2017. And even though I was very familiar with Renaissance art, I felt like I was seeing it for the first time. Uh, one day in the Uffizi, as I tried to keep my marauding three-year-old son from breaking the arm of a statue, uh, I found a moment of calm in front of this painting here, uh, actually, thanks to my in-laws who are kind enough to join us this evening, who helped me help, help with our children. And I stood in front of the Cestello Annunciation, uh, which is not one of the most famous works by Botticelli. And I thought I was seeing the Renaissance for the first time in this painting. Um, and I saw, if you notice, if you notice the beautiful, the Renaissance, the line, if you follow the bottom of the wing, across the shoulder, onto the fingertips of the archangel, into Mary's fingertips around her shoulder and back. It creates this beautiful feedback loop, you know? As, as, a, as, a, as a, a group I was speaking to, a student once said, you know, Mary's saying, not me, this is a big responsibility. 
you know, she's being tasked here with the, the, the birth of the Holy Child. But the, beyond the religious theme, if you look at the painting, look at how rational this space is. Look at the, the one point perspective, your eyes are guided, even they're trained to see one point perspective by the lines of the floor. And look at the setting. I mean, this is an apartment you could Airbnb. It's a, it's a Florentine apartment. It's, it's actually a pastiche of a painting if you look closely, because it's an unusual mix of biblical themes, the standard enunciation, which so many painters did, and yet it's set in a modern setting. So there's a collision and there's a lot of anachronism in the painting, A and B. Most important, and this is where I saw the Renaissance. Look at Mary. I mean, look at that figure. Look at the sense of joy, earthly joy. It's almost as though she's enthralled to something, almost as though she's about to dance, sway. There's something, a sense of earthly pleasure in this painting. And that comes from Botticelli's immersion in the humanism of Quattrocento Firenze. His conversations with Poliziano, with the Medici, uh, you know, his, Cristoforo Landino, all these great scholars and humanists that are rescuing pagan antiquity and bringing it back. And so Botticelli, in a sense, is encoding this religious painting with all these humanist messages. One of the most moving things I read that year at Vili Tanti was by a great art historian named Abby Warburg, who said, when you look at paintings like this and you see beautiful drapery and hair, think of them as messages that you're meant to decode. And what you see here is that Botticelli is sort of staging a, 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 a beautiful collision or dialogue between the religious theme of the painting and this earthy, earthy, earthly, humanist, pagan culture that is permeating Florence of his time. And that's the exact same tension that I found in the Dante drawing, which I'd never seen before. I'd seen these drawings. Everyone who studies Dante knows Botticelli's Dante drawings. But I didn't see that tension between the secular and the sacred, between the earthly and the divine. If you notice, this is an illustration from Dante's uh, Hell, Botticelli. This is one of the few illustrations that has color in it. Most of them are in sketch form. But you'll notice that Botticelli, it's almost as though he doesn't want to deal with Dante's punishments. It's not that interesting to him. He's after something else. His vision of Dante, which becomes much more than an illustration, I think is trying to work out this inherited tension between secularity humanism, paganism, and the Christian culture that's sanctioning a project like this. And it drives Botticelli's Dante drugs. The interesting thing is, after Inferno, when he gets to Paradiso, he hits his stride. This is what almost all the drawings in Paradiso look like. They are the most ethereal of sketches. And in the Renaissance, by and large, drawings were not finished products. They were kind of prelude to a painting. You've seen Leonardo's cartoons and things of that nature. So it, it was it accidentally that the, these were left undone, but we have these now as sort of works of art on their own. And Don, Botticelli's Paradiso is a celestial dance between Dante and Beatrice. Sparse, intimate, beautiful. So it hit me that I had these drawings all wrong, that I had seen them as beautiful in that kind of Botticellian way but it struck me that this was a profound interpretation of Dante's poem and I wanted to learn more about it. And then the deeper I dug, the more I learned that this was an amazing story, uh, that the paint, that the drawings had disappeared for 400 years. No one knows why. Um, they were rediscovered by a German art historian in 1881, Friedrich Lippmann. Uh, he identified them definitively as by Botticelli and Botticelli alone. People thought they were different hands involved. No one was certain. It was one of the biggest mysteries in art history. And no one can say for sure to this day why the paintings, why the drawings disappeared. We have speculations. Uh, there's a big speculation, which I think makes a lot of sense, that they were given as a gift by Botticelli's patron, uh, Lorenzo di Pier Francesco dei Medici to King Charles VIII uh, when he entered Florence, you know, when he, when he uh, invaded Florence in 1494, 1495. 
Uh, it's very plausible. It, can you what a gift that would make? You know, can you imagine they're all sitting around the French Royal Court uh, Christmas tree and Charles's siblings get the Renaissance equivalent of a tie or an Amazon gift card, and Charles gets all all the drawings of Dante's Divine Comedy by Botticelli. It's a uh, it, it makes for a great image to imagine that because the drawings were in France for centuries. But the bottom line is we just don't know. Uh, and not only that, you know, um, Botticelli himself disappears. And this is even more remarkable for those of us who love Renaissance art and harder to believe because Giorgio Vasari, a founding, a founder of modern art history, no stranger, I'm sure the name to most, to pretty much everyone in this room, he wrote the, the La Vita dei, dei Pittori, uh, Scultori, Architettori, the lives of the uh, painters, sculptors, and architects. Notice he didn't say the word artist because that word really wasn't used back then. You know, um, the, the myth of the modern artist, uh, Ingrid Rowland and Noah Carney have written on this, was almost basically created by Bazaar, these, these people who were touched by the gods. Botticelli and, and the people, the Quattrocento, they thought of themselves as, as craftspeople. You know, they were workers. Botticelli went to Prentice as a goldsmith when he was in his, you know, early teenage years. No formal schooling. So um, this myth of the artist is largely Vasari's making. But Vasari did not like Botticelli that much. Uh, to give you an, an example of how little... His biography in the Penguin edition is about seven pages. Michelangelo gets about 130. So he spoke with his pen. Uh, Michelangelo, he revered as a god. He saw the last, he called that, you know, you can call that phase three of the Renaissance. That was when the, um, the Renaissance hit its stride and Botticelli was transitional for Bazaar. And not only that, he, he said that drawing Dante created infinite disorder in Botticelli's life. Uh, he, he thought Botticelli was out of his element trying to illustrate Dante, that he was, had no formal education. He wasn't a true scholar. What was he doing? He should have stuck to his knitting and continued to make mythological paintings. Um, so it's a fascinating chapter and largely, in large part because of Vasari's dismissal of Botticelli, Botticelli becomes sort of second rate status for much of the 1600s and 1700s. Part of the reason has to do with this individual. Now that is an intense looking face, isn't it? Uh, and you know who that is, the so-called mad monk of Ferrara, uh, Savonarola. You know, the rumor was, and I never found it conclusively proved, I don't think he was officially, that Botticelli was a chiagnone, a weeper, a follower of Savonarola, that he renounced, allegedly, which he didn't, uh, his, his art and that it was seen as a sign of vanity and that, you know, in the age of the bonfires of the vanity, bonfire of the vanities, 1490s, uh, after the Medici were ousted, that Botticelli um, became a follower. That's what Savonarola, that was, that's what Vasari said. Don't necessarily think that's um, true or provable. Botticelli's painting does change though. After he, he's born in 1445, he finishes the Dante drawings about 1495. Uh, you know, it has to uh, consign the project then. The last years of his life are difficult ones. He dies in 1510. And he has fallen out of the orbit of the great artist, the most well-paid. He dies basically in poverty and kind of forgotten. Uh, to give you a sense how someone recorded his death and spelt his name wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like recently I read the New York Times when Melville died, they spelt Moby Dick, M-O-B-I-E. You know, that, that shows that you've been forgotten a little bit. I think they called him Bottirelli or something like that. They, they, you know, he, his name was misspelled. He, he was no longer um, ascended in the Florentine art scene. So um, what happened? Well, he was forgotten. Uh, the, the, the drawings may have been given to King Charles VIII. We don't know for sure, um, but we do know this for sure. After the drawings were definitively rediscovered in the late 1800s, things kind of went from bad to worse and then even worse than worse, whatever that is. Because the drawings ended up in Germany and we know what happened in Germany in the early 20th century, okay? 
um, the drawings were sequestered during World War II. Uh, they were put in the, the German government as Berlin was about to fall. Uh, before that, they were sort of shunted to the countryside, put in a salt mine to protect priceless works. They ended up coming back into Berlin. And one day, a monuments man, like this guy here, you see him? Dean Keller, who was a professor of painting at Yale before he went to guard. This image is just so uh, riveting, isn't it? He's protecting the Primavera from looting troops in a castle in Tuscany. Well, one day, one of the monuments men, not this one, but Mason Hammond, who actually taught classics at Harvard, opened up a crate and pulled out a drawing in the 1940s, and it was Botticelli's Dante drawing. So they survived the war, miraculously, um, but they didn't survive the Cold War. Then they were divided between East and West Berlin, 27 in West Berlin, 57 in East Berlin. That's where most of the drawings were. There were about eight or so in Rome. So they were only united in 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall. So they've kind of become a symbol, I think, of European unity. I think of them as an index of some of the most convulsive moments in 20th century history. And the fact that they're together to me is a kind of testament to a, a theme I'll come back to the resilience of art, and the, the ability of art to withstand history. History, even as most violent and awful, you know, the, the fact that this occurred during um, this, this horrifying period in German history, that the, the drawings were taken out of the city. So it, it just, it raises so many questions. So I decided to write about it. And I thought, how did Dan Brown not get to this idea first? <laughs> you know, luckily I beat him to it. I'm sure he'll write a novel that will sell a lot more copies than my book. Uh, but I thought I'm going to tell a nonfiction version of this story. So the first half of my book is basically how the drawings were created in uh, Medici Florence, uh, Botticelli. It's a mini biography of Botticelli, a person we don't really know that much about. I actually think the last best biography of Botticelli was in 1908 by a fellow whose name many of you in this room will know, Herbert Horn. The Horn Museum is a gem in Florence. If you haven't been, please go. He was an astonishing collector. And he wrote this, he was a printmaker. He wrote this incredible, he spent his whole life. He was guilty for all the money he was making for his commission. So he lived in a garret and filled up the Horn Museum with beautiful works of art. You know, he's sort of like um, very different from Berenson, but they were in the same world. And he is a brilliant Botticelli scholar, but his biography is all about the works because we know very little. Sandro left nothing, no piece of writing in his hand. Everything is in the images. So with that in mind, I would just share a few thoughts before we open it up to questions about, you know, the kind of uh, themes and ideas that stuck with me as I wrote the book. The first thing I would say is that for me personally, if you don't mind me sharing, the book was kind of a watershed in that I had a very traditional academic track. I published a couple books with uh, university presses and I loved that world of scholarship. And then I went the extreme opposite. I wrote two very personal books, My Two Italy's, This Is My Family in Italy in the 1950s before immigration. And I wrote a book called um, In a Dark Wood, What Dante Taught Me About Grief, Healing and the Mysteries of Love. And I realized at this point, you know, I didn't wanna be, now I, I remember once I was speaking to a senior colleague um, at a place I taught to before I taught taught at before Bard, and I I asked him about this older colleague, his retired colleague, who was being honored. And I said, "What was he like?" And he said, "What can I say? What can you say about a guy who wrote eight books about himself?" <laughs> you know, I was like, "I didn't want to be that person." So you know, two was enough. Uh, so I was looking for the next book to write, and um, this book became that book because. It's, it's the thing that I'm happiest about with this book is that it has like 80 pages of notes and bibliography, but it's all tucked in the back. The book is driven by stories. It's not an academic book. It's meant for regular readers. It's meant for the reading public, but it allowed me to kind of put storytelling and scholarly research together. So that's why I use the word betwixt and between. Um, it's also a testament to Dante. I mean, look, here we are in Florence on the Arno. I mean, what a fitting place to be talking about this book. 
this whole book is about Dante's enormous shadow. He's born in Florence in 1265. He's exiled forever in 1302. And guess what? That exile is not revoked officially until 2008. <laughs> Talk about holding a grudge. <laughs> so 706 years. But meanwhile, he became a celebrity. Immediately, he died a celebrity. The Divine Comedy was circulating in manuscript form. By 1399, there were 800 manuscripts of the Divine Comedy in circulation. Florentine school children were taught it. Uh, Sacchetti wrote Le Trecenti Novelle, 300 stories. They're stories of like um, garbage collectors and blacksmiths singing the Divine Comedy. And Dante goes up to him and like, I think pushes one of them or yells at one saying, stop messing up my poem. You know, he's so, he's so uh, proud and haughty. But that shows you Dante's work permeated public spaces. When Botticelli was tapped to do this in 1481, I mean, it was the honor of a lifetime for this local painter to be asked to translate Dante's Divine Comedy in this private deluxe volume by commissioned by a Medici family member. Just shows you, just like this painting here from the Duomo, uh, Micolino's Dante holding the comedy. You know, uh, there it is, the symbol of the city. Dante is already the symbol of the city by the time Botticelli's illustrating the Divine Comedy in 1481. So that just goes to show you how entrenched Dante is in this city's imaginary. Who was Botticelli? Mondo Botticelliano. You know, it's not even his name. His name is uh, uh, Alessandro uh, de Filippetti. Um, Botticelli was the nickname. The, apparently members of his family had this squat barrel-like build, Botticelli, Botticello. Um, we know so little about him. Um, I spent a lot of time with Botticelli's ghost. What was he like? Humble, uh, a workman to the end. Leonardo finished 20 paintings or so in his life. He would get distracted. If he didn't want to finish the commission, he'd go write in his notebook. Do yourself a favor after this talk. Google Leonardo's to-do list. It'll make you, it makes me feel bad about myself. Mine is like cat food. Don't forget the dry laundry. Leonardo's is like draw Milan. You know, speak to the professor of mathematics at Padua, things like that. Um, Botticelli was different. He had a workshop in Onisanti, not far from here. He lived on the same street his whole life, basically. And he delivered on the commissions. He had an intellectual, insatiable intellectual um, curiosity. His, his school, his university, you know, was the Medici court, talking with Poliziano about humanism and paganism, speaking with the Medici brothers about poetry and myth, you know, learning from people like Landino. That was his world, and that gave him the education he never had. And he was also famous for un carattere allegro e burlone, carefree and roguish character. He loved his practical jokes. Uh, this was a rough and tumble world. A lot of these artists, they, were, they, were, they weren't educated formally. I mean, these were hard living, you know, often uh, hard partying types who really just lived to the fullest and, um, you know, loved to play jokes on one another. So it's a fascinating sociology, the bottega, the world of the bottega and the workshop. Um, who paid for it all? Well, again, you know better than most because you, you're in Florence. A lot of it was the Medici. The Medici, there's a brilliant book by Tim Parks, uh, Medici Money, Banking, Metaphysics, and the Art in 15th Century. Florence, which showed you just how many works were funded, underwritten by the Medici. Now, there were practical reasons they did this. Florence is a small city, as you know. You can walk across the Cento Storico in half an hour, if, if that but it wanted to seem bigger than it was. It wanted to seem more glorious than it was. And so the Medici understood that one of the ways to do that was through art. Make yourself, give yourself the patina of, immor of immortality. Give yourself the grandeur of these beautiful works, fun public works. The Medici were all over this. 
And so part of it was calculated um, and they could be brutal and they could be manipulative and they had many enemies and they pretended to be, you know, uh, well, they were famous into pares, as they say, first among equals, except there were no equals. They were far and away the, the most powerful family until they were ousted. Um, but the remarkable thing is I discovered there was a genuine understanding and love of art in this family for all their cruelties and manipulations and real politic. And to get a sense of that, just go to the Bargello and look at this painting, at this sculpture here, the David. I mean, it is such a glorious sculpture by Donatello. He does it later in life, uh, around 1440. He had done an earlier one, which is pretty workmanlike, of just a marble David, very kind of traditional. This bronze one is, is sublime. And it's not the athletic warrior David of Michelangelo or the kind of tough, again, warrior looking one of Verrocchio. It's much more uh, delicate. It's much more, uh, exudes a different aura altogether. And the Medici, you know, the saying was, Cosimo put that in the courtyard of the family compound. Now, the Medici uh, palace is not for everyone. One scholar called it a Renaissance McMansion. <laughs> I mean, it's enormous. <laughs> There's no lawn, you know, no lawn, obviously. You know what I mean? It's like, it just takes, it looks like a bank vault in a fortress. That's what it's supposed to be. But smack dab in the middle of it, greeting visitors was this magnificent sculpture. All that money, all that wealth, all that power, made a lot of enemies. And the Pazzi conspiracy in 1478, um, they tried to oust the, the Medici in the Duomo and Giuliano was killed, Lorenzo escaped. Uh, the Medici reacted with biblical vengeance and they hanged or uh, you know, executed all the conspirators. And guess who took this image down? Uh, Botticelli was commissioned to paint the uh, hanged effigies of the um, conspirators on the wall. But this is a little photo journalism or art journalism by Leonardo. He drew this as a young man. He saw these ghoulish images of uh, these executed conspirators. And this goes to show you what I call the chiaroscuro of Florentine history. One, on the one hand, sublime beauty, on the other hand, violence and incredible discord. Um, you know, the Renaissance, one of the arguments I make in my book is that when Botticelli's Dante was rediscovered, it was part of a process of rediscovering the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a term invented in the late 1800s. It didn't exist. It wasn't like in the 1400s, they were sitting around saying, boy, isn't it great to be alive in the Renaissance? Thank God, you know, that all that intense uh, you know, self-denial we had to go through in the Middle Ages is over. No, they, they didn't, there was not, the, the word didn't exist. It was a creation of the late 19, 1800s. And one of the great uh, minds behind it was Jakob Burkhardt, his book, The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. But how did Burkhardt come to write this book? He wrote a tour guide, a, a guide to um, the painting of Italy, the art in Italy. He went up and down the peninsula looking firsthand at all the great works of Italian art. I think this was fundamental for Burkhardt to see the art firsthand, to see it with his own eyes, to see what I'll call in a little bit the aura of the original. So this is very much what my book is about. What is the original artwork? What is its effect on you? And so it led to this great book here. And you know, when we think about this, you have to remember, uh, there's a talk, I guess, on the Bardini next week. Was that it? Yeah. Th these people like Barents and Bardini, uh, Lippmann, it, it was the, the art world was a wild west. You know, you could get forgeries. It was very hard to say. There was no infrared detection. It was all about the eye, the connoisseur, these catalogs that these art historians had. And you could buy a Botticelli because it was risky. You didn't know if you were getting a fake. In 1867, Dante Gabriel Rossetti buys this painting, Smeralda Bandinelli, portrait by Botticelli, for 20 pounds. That's the equivalent of $3,000 today. 20 pounds. Can you imagine 
um, it's now with this painting sell for almost 100 million. But this was how tenuous and out of favor Botticelli's work had become at that time and how risky an investment it was considered. Um, I, I think of my book in a way as an homage to what I call the eyes of Florence. This is Berenson in his uh, study at Villa Itati. Uh, Berenson um, gave the villa back to Harvard, but he experienced a lot of uh, negative feelings there. He was an immigrant. He experienced anti-Semitism at Harvard. Um, it was really a, a struggle for him, uh, but he wanted to show the world that he had made it. He wanted to um, give the gift of art back to people. And part of this was this, this unbelievable gift that he had, that he could look at paintings, these connoisseurs, and tell just by the mental catalogs that they had created what was an original and what was fake. Um, and I think that's part of the, this whole journey with this book is that ultimately I think of this artworks as having this, these remarkable resilience. And going back to this image, the Cold War, the threat of, the, of nuclear disaster, the being housed in a city that's divided into Berlin, being, being rescued from a city under siege, Berlin, and put into a salt mine and then back into the former Reichsbank. Somehow, the work survived disappearing for 400 years. The book reminded me in a kind of um, sometimes somewhat chilling way how easily these beautiful works of art can disappear, how they can be destroyed, how in times of political disaster, they're under siege and threat. And then even more unsettling, what happens if we as a society and culture stop looking at them? You know, part of the book was about, I think we live in a culture, a, a virtual, we live in a virtual age, of course. You know, what is it to mean to be, have contact with original works of art in an unmediated way, without a screen, without social media, and just look and let the paintings work their magic on you? And that's the spirit that I want to read just very briefly from my book about this last image. And then I'll open it up for questions. Because what happened was when I decided to write about the book, I said, well, I have to see the original. I have to see the aura of the original firsthand. And I can't write the book without that. So um, at one point towards the end of my stay in, in Florence in 2017, I said, well, I have two choices. I can go to Berlin where there's most of the drawings are, or I can go to Rome. And I kind of wanted to do this in Italy because this felt like an Italian project to me, which has the great Don, greatest Dante drawing of all, the map of hell. This is the, the only one of all planned 102 drawings that Botticelli finished. And it's a guide to all of hell. Some of you may have seen the reproduction. I've certainly seen it many times but I wanted to see the original. It was in the Vatican. So I started to write the Vatican. Have you ever dealt with Italian bureaucracy? Yeah. Let's just say that went nowhere fast. I said, okay, I'm just gonna show up. An idea is foolhardy in retrospect as it sounds now. Uh, I took the train one morning to Rome and I said, I'm just gonna go ask to see this drawing. I'm not getting anywhere with my former request. So I take the train to Rome, I get to the Vatican Museum. I didn't realize how enormous it is. <laughs> and I'm led through a series of rooms and I start talking to employees. And I basically say, you know, I'm a professor. I would like to write this book. May I please see Botticelli's uh, drawings of Dante? And they basically looked at me like, who are you and what are you doing here? Uh, and I went through this with a few different people. Finally, I said, can I please speak to the director? Not even knowing who the director was at that point. Um, and they said, okay. So the director comes out very kind and uh, gracious man. And he says, I'm very sorry, sir, but this is one of the most precious works in our collection. I, they're not for public display. You know, I, I, there's just no way this is going to happen. And I, it was like showing up at the Louvre and saying, can I just hang out with the Mona Lisa for a little bit? You know, uh, it wasn't going to happen. And so I started to turn around to leave. And then I thought to myself, one last try and I'll read to you what happened. Okay. 
Solo 15 minuti. Just 15 minutes, I begged. Va bene, he said, startling me with his change of mind. Okay, 15 minutes, just you and me, no pencil, no paper, no photos. A few minutes later, I was led into a private room of the Vatican. And there it was, Botticelli's map of hell, along with a small selection of other more sparsely drawn illustrations from the early cantos of the poem. The director and I stood before them in silence, our gaze fully absorbed by that lone full color image of Inferno. The first thing that struck me was how incredibly different it appeared from the many reproductions I had seen of it. What they failed to capture was Botticelli's hand. I could see in the, in the, the remarkably precise painstaking details that are glossed over in reproduction, the scoring of the parchment, the tiniest of features and gestures in the sinners, the varying hues and shades within the individual colors. It was all there in a way that a reproduction could never capture. What I saw for the first time was Botticelli's vision of Dante's hell. Somehow all the mind boggling intricacies and textures coalesced into a seamless whole. The German philosopher Walter Benjamin described the aura of art as that inexplicable energy that emanates from the original, a sensation so palpable that it can make looking feel like a religious rite. The word comes from the Latin for gold, aurum, and suggests the energy or glow a work of beauty exudes, reminding us why Petrarch chose the name Laura for his source of poetic inspiration. According to Benjamin, to grasp an artwork's true aura, you need to go back to the moment in time of its creation by a human hand. That quest for originals had led Jakob Burkhardt to scour the Italian peninsula for glimpses of works that would fuel his theory of the Renaissance. The eureka moment of Friedrich Littmann's lifetime, the certainty that all the illustrations in the Dante cycle were by Botticelli and Botticelli alone, could only have occurred as he contemplated the painter's images in their large parchment volume. Six centuries before Benjamin, Dante wrote that art at its best was a visibile parlare, a visible speech that feels like heaven's own language. No words better captured the effect of looking at Botticelli's illustrations. My 15 minutes with a map of hell were up. I thanked the director and said goodbye. Botticelli had shared his secret. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And good evening, Zoomers. Nice to be that you're now up on the screen. So if you want to uh, share your image, we can see you. And if you want to talk to us, you can unmute and talk to us. So as always, the rules of um, the question answers in the room. If you want to uh, ask a question, make a comment, put your hand up and I'll bring the microphone to you so that Zoomers can hear you. And uh, those out on the Zoom, you can either put something up, up in the chat and we'll read it out for you. Or if you're feeling really brave, you can um, unmute and talk to us and we'll hear you in the room. Okay, so I think I've got a question right here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a fan. So I have a few questions. How did the map of hell get to the Vatican and okay. everything else is somewhere else? And is there even a chance ever of these ever being shown on public, protect some kind of public view? Yeah, good, two excellent questions. So we know that the drawings um, were in France and this is what the, the, the theory that they might have been given to King Charles VIII as a gift because at some point the drawings were broken up and um, seven sheets with eight total drawings ended up in the collection of this remarkable woman, King, uh, Queen Christina of Sweden, uh, a remarkable collector of art in the 1600s. And she lived in Rome and she gave them to the Vatican when she died, her eight, eight total drawings. And one of the drawings, she had basically the first Canti of Inferno uh, the early Canti of Inferno and this map of hell. So they, that's how they ended up in Rome. And the rest were in this collection. They, they, they ended up actually in Scotland in the, the Alexander family, uh, the Hamilton family, sorry, the Hamilton family. And that's where they were um, purchased in London in 1881 by the German government. 
and they're so related to history because why did the German government buy them? Well, in 1871, Germany formed, uh, it became a nation and they wanted to add to the luster of their newly formed German nation by purchasing these remarkable drawings. And Britain uh, really kind of uh, waffled uh, and let the drawings leave the country. And many uh, British people, Ruskin, uh, Princess uh, Victoria were very upset about this, but there was a sense that um, Germany wanted them at all costs because they, you know, this is the whole idea of bringing the Renaissance home. Um, so that's why most of the drawings that have been Germany, they are displayed from time to time. That's what I said, they're a symbol of European unity. They were uh, displayed in, um, there was, a, a, uh, there was a, um, an exhibit in the main cities that had been involved in, the, in, the, in, the, in holding the drawings, including Rome and Berlin. Uh, there's a beautiful catalog of that exhibit that you can get. So they are occasionally exhibited uh, together. And my dream is hopefully, you know, if, if, if my book can have any effect, I would love for them to come to the United States. That would be a dream of mine to be exhibited or Florence. <laughs> yes, the Uffizi, that would be also quite special. We haven't, haven't gone uh, about here. <laughs> yeah. Another reason to come back to Florence. So I, I, they are, you know, there's always the hope and, um, you know, hopefully the possibility that they will be all displayed together again. Thank you. Something on the chat. Um, oh no, this is a question. Oh, remember to do their donations. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, in the room, do we have another one? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Um, in Berlin, are they in the Gemälde Galleria? They're in the um, Kufistik cabinet, the, the print collection. So that's, and they were there from the beginning because the great Friedrich Lippmann, the connoisseur who identified them was the curator of that collection. So they were housed there in, in their back home as it were. So uh, yeah, so that's where they are. Okay, um, on, on the Zoom chat, um, uh, Brenda, I'll come back to you in a moment and you will unmute and talk to us, I know you will. But um, have we got from uh, on the chat from Elizabeth Mason, uh, I've noticed that in Berlin, the Dante drawings are not regularly on display. What was your observations on the integrity of the drawings themselves and the material that they're on? So they're done on sheepskin. Botticelli used a series of styluses, um, silver point. Um, most of them are in very, especially Paradiso and Purgatory, most of them are in very unfinished state, they're sketches. You know, uh, uh, it looks like his plan had been to draw and paint them all which was utterly impossible. <laughs> he only finished one of them. It, it's not like he finished a third of them or half of them. I mean, when you only do one one hundredth of a project to completion, uh, you're not making much pace. And why is that? Because it wasn't like he was being inactive. He was executing masterpiece paintings, you know, by the bushel. Um, these were, this is why I, say, I think of the project as done in the margins of his career and almost as a kind of a diary of sorts an implicit diary, you know, the way Petra, uh, Michelangelo wrote these beautiful Petrarchan sonnets to express his inner, uh, his inner life, especially his inner torment. Uh, Leonardo had his notebooks. And I think of this as kind of Botticelli's version of that, that he, at a certain point it had to be clear to him he was never going to finish them. And I think he was relieved when finally his patron said, you know, basta, you have to, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> At a certain point, there's a, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, you know, every student should be allowed to uh, complete a course, <laughs> but at a certain point you have to say, you know, time's up. Uh, so uh, this was the, the reality of uh, their unfinished state and they're very fragile, um, very sensitive to light. So that's why they're not shown that much. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. It's interesting to think then of a parallel with um, Michelangelo's famous Prigionieri in, in the Academia, which is another right. massive project he was commissioned to do and had never the shot, hope in hell of ever finishing it. And you got the the, the half finished sculptures. Which, That's right. Which is in the Academia. They're much more robust than so they can be on display. That's right. But it's a similar kind of thing going on there, I guess. And it's kind of an accidental beauty because um, he wouldn't have considered them finished. The sketches are magnificent and they sort of communicate something 
Uh, Dante's Paradiso, a lot of it is about subtraction, sparseness, uh, simplicity, that simplicity on the other side of complexity, as they say. And so the, these, these very um, spare drawings of Paradiso really do communicate well a vision of Paradiso. And it's, it's fascinating because to the modern sensibility, the unfinished nature, again, with the Michelangelo That's right. you don't want the progenitary to be done, taken any further. That's right. They're perfect as they are, you know. Yeah. You know, uh, I read somewhere that there was a sense that uh, was Botticelli an avant-garde uh, uh, artist, uh, avant la lettre. You know, did did he plan it this way? Uh, that would be a stretch. You know, he wasn't the guy. He wasn't like you know Picasso entering his cubist period. He was just a, he he delivered commissions. He did what you told him to do, and he did a beautiful did job. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give uh, Brenda the chance to talk to us, and then we'll go to David. Yes, yeah. so Brenda, let's hear you. Yeah, hello. Um, hello from Dublin. Um, I, I wish I was there to buy the book, but I, I will buy it anyway. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Most, most enjoyable. Um, I come away from it with, well, many things, but uh, two, two things of a quite uh, human nature. Uh, the one, uh, the first one is um, how lucky we all are that um, your parents uh, emigrated uh, and you, you were able to become an art historian um, and give us such a wonderful lecture. The second thing is, uh, as an art historian myself, I'm, I'm really taken with your impetuosity and your enthusiasm that actually allowed you to get into the Vatican. Uh, which is quite, <laughs> which Those are two is nice quite, words for it. Which is quite a feat, um, and uh, it just shows. I think if you're enthusiastic enough about something, I think perhaps that you speak Italian so well um, might have helped. Uh, if I had gone, I mightn't have managed it quite as well, in spite <laughs> of my enthusiasm. <laughs> Thank I, you. I very appreciate much. that. Thank you so Thank much. You. I appreciate that, Brenda. Thanks. It's very Thanks. kind. Uh, I will say one thing. You know. My training was not in art history. I, you know, I, I am a professor of literature. I've, I've taught Italian studies and Italian culture across the different disciplines, including film and art and whatnot. But um, I think being a little bit coming to it as an outsider, that actually helped me with the project because you know so much has been written on Botticelli. So much has been written on the Italian Renaissance. But I didn't have that kind of scholarly um, apparatus to worry about with a book like this. And yet I learned a ton writing it. I mean, it was like an education in, in art history. So I think part of the enthusiasm and the passion was just my joy in, in going so deep into a field that I had wanted to, to study for in, in this level. So uh, I'm glad it came through. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually could I just add, I think uh, you're touching on something there that I think the more multidisciplinary we all are, the, the more we can enrich uh, all the different fields, you know, there's been uh, a little bit perhaps too much of sub 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 specialization. Um, and that uh, people lose sight of the bigger picture very, sometimes, you know, thank uh, you. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. great. Uh Thank you. I'll come back to that. It's an important point. Excellency, <laughs> that was an absolutely delightful uh, introduction to your to your book. Thank you, um, David. Wonderful personal reflections of how you how, how you got to it. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to reading it. Um, in his chaotic life, did Botticelli have a large number of patrons? Yes. And did they and did they record any impressions of having him working for them? Excellent question. He had a very wide circle of patrons. He had regular patrons. Um, he was principally a painter of why his career kind of went on the downward slope after the, the ousting of the Medici in the, in the 14, uh, mid 1490s was that as Renaissance Florence became much more sort of um, doctrinal in the era of Savonarola, the taste for Botticelli's mythological paintings wane, and that sense of joy that's very palpable in Botticelli's painting, earthly joy that we talked about, there was less of a taste for that. And he was always more of a domestic painter than a religious painter. He was always commissioned more by patrons for you know, the interior of houses. He certainly did paint for churches as well, but he had a very uh, robust network of patrons 
Lorenzo di Pier Francesco dei Medici, the one who commissioned the Dante volume, was the cousin of Lorenzo Magnifico. Uh, the Pucci family, uh, which was from his Ogni Santi neighborhood. Uh, there's just, you know, it's, it's the who's who of, of Renaissance Florence in terms of the wealthy merchants. Because what happened with Botticelli, he was trained by uh, Fra uh, Filippo Lippi. And then he in turn trained Fra uh, Lippo Lippi's son, Filippino Lippi. So he got an incredible artistic education. And he started his workshop in his early 20s. And he immediately, immediately got onto the radar of the best radar to get on, the Medici radar. Uh, Soderini, who was Il Magnifico's right-hand man, promoted his career from the start. And in 1470, when Botticelli was only 25, he commissioned him to do a work in the uh, Mercanzia, in the, right in the Palazzo Vecchio area, the, the public, where all the guilds were housed. And he did this painting, Fortitude, which I, I think it's in the UBC, I'm pretty sure, Fortitude. And that was the beginning of his career. And he was named master of painting. It was 1470, 1480, 1490. He had like basically a 25 year run of uninterrupted success with um, the deepest pocketed patrons. So the mm -hmm. Primavera, we're not entirely sure. There's still an aura of mystery around his two most famous works. Um, the scholarship is very deep. A lot of it comes back to the Medici family and branches of the Medici family, but there is still a lot of controversy as to exactly when and who specifically commissioned them. Um, there's a lot of uh, scholarly work that suggests that um, I think it was the Primavera was uh, given, may have been given as a wedding present to the man who commissioned Botticelli's Dante's drawings, Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de Medici. We don't know, we're not exactly by whom, but I always, you know, as I tell my students and when I speak about the book, that's a pretty nice place to go to sleep at night. Yeah. You know, if, if it was a wedding, the, 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 you know, the Primavera would be hanging in a wow. Medici townhouse. So uh, without being absolutely sure who the patrons were, the, the ties to them, it, was, it's, it seems to be in the Medici orbit. No one here. Thank you, John, for this absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, I, I'd like to ask you, something not as a Botticelli expert or as a Dante expert, but as a passionate advocate of Renaissance studies. Um, when I was teaching at an American university, something that I encountered from time to time was an attitude that said, um, really the Renaissance, you think of it as a big deal, but you know, you're a, a white guy. Um, my heritage is African or Asian or Latin American, and this really doesn't have very much to do with me. So what would you say to somebody like that? It's a wonderful and it's an important question. Um, I teach the Renaissance now, and versions of that question come up all the time. And it's a central question in my classroom, and uh, one that, that we have to address because it's fundamental. You know, whose Renaissance is it? is basically the question. And the way we talk about it, and I think it's an open question, there's no definitive answer. Uh, there's a, a, there was a groundbreaking essay in 1976 by Joan Kelly called, um, Did Women Have a Renaissance? And her answer was, she didn't think so, <laughs> emphatically not. And she talks about this passage in The Courtier where um, you know uh, one of the characters is meant to tell her story, and it's a woman, and she said, well, you know, the men have told so many great stories. Um, why don't we just let them speak? And, you know, the scholar points out the not the kind of, ex, you know, not implicit misogyny, but pretty explicit, the, the silencing of women. Um, and so but that was, you know, 50 years ago. Since then, we, there's been a lot of studies that show there were Renaissance women artists. Uh, not to the extent of men, but, you know, think of artists like Artemisia, remarkable artist. 
uh, and even names that are less known than she. Uh, so, you know, scholars are doing the good work of finding out these new renaissances. Um, the way, one of the way I talk about it with my students is I say, you know, if we think of the Renaissance as a historical fact, as something in the 1500s, um, then yes, it was mostly an elite phenomenon. It was mostly, um, you know, the privileged class were, were commissioning these works. Um, people like Botticelli were working class, but once they entered into the orbit of the Medici, they became de facto part of that world. But I also say there's another way to think of the Renaissance not as an historical fact, but as a mindset. And that's what's much more interesting to me. What happened in the 1500s and the 1400s was you had a society that had experienced plague that had wiped out two thirds of Florence, the great plague of the 1346 uh, to 1353, political division and schism. Italy wasn't unified till 1861. And enormous disparities in class and well, where you, you had one percenters, pretty much like, you know, scholars have studied this, the top percent owned most of the, the money in the city. And yet, against all those odds, this remarkable work of art was created. Brunelleschi creates the Duomo without ever formally studying engineering in school. Can you imagine that? By observing buildings in nature, Botticelli illustrates all 100 drawings of Dante without ever studying in school. Michelangelo considered him a sculptor, self a sculpture, and he ended up painting the Sistine Chapel. So they too faced their share of obstacles. They too were living among people who owned much more than them. But the Renaissance mindset, humanism, problem solving, a belief in creativity, that saw them through. And I think that happens any, all over the world. There was a Harlem Renaissance that's remarkable when you think of the art and the music and the dance that was created in Harlem. You know, you think of the, uh, the amazing, uh, the, 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 the jazz musicians, the authors. Uh, Ralph Ellison in, Invi in Invisible Man describes this cultural ferment. There's, uh, so, you know, Renaissance happened, Renaissance, Renaissances can happen anywhere. Um, that's what I think is the important thing to take from it, is that, yes, there certainly were inequalities, cruelties, and unfairnesses and injustices. But that being the case, we can take that mindset and apply it to our own problems today, which are different. Problems like climate change, problems like political schism, problems like, you know, the breakdown of public discourse in an age of uh, toxic social media. Those are the problems we have to create our own renaissance to solve. You know, we're not, we can't fight the battles of the Cinquecento. You know, we have to fight the battles of today. And I think the renaissance can be a guide to us in that sense. I hope that answers. Yep, very good. Um, well, it could be a good note to end on unless people um, got something they're burning to contribute. Zoomers. Are you done? And I'm happy to, uh, if during yes. sale and sign, I'm happy to individually. We're absolutely going to do that. We've got one more couple. Okay, of great. Last chat. question. Is it a question or a comment? Uh, oh, from Alice Smith Duncan. This may be my favorite Brit Institute lecture ever. <laughs> oh, thanks, Alice. Thank you so much to Joseph Lutzi, and cannot wait to read not just this new book, but the early ones as well. Uh, and she sends uh, hugs and kisses. So <laughs> I think thank you very much, Alice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. To, thank you. To thank you. Um, and now we, we uh, Zoom as I'm afraid we have to say good night because we don't, as my hard old joke, we don't know how to do virtual wine, but you can tell the person. So um, what we do now is, is in two parts. Those of you who want to uh, get the book and have it signed, Paper of Exchange are with us tonight. Special discount for you guys on, on the pianos line up and get your books. And we're going to reorganize this table here. And Joe, Joe Joseph will sign for you. And meanwhile, the wine through that, courtesy of Fred Cabaldi, very nice Chianti Classico tonight, is waiting for you. So thanks, everybody, and see you all next week. <laughs>